Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, chief executive fish nerd, licensed fishing guide, and now feeling bad about my life choices, uh, your host of the podcast. With me today, and we're so lucky, is Doc Martin. Doc Martin's a biologist, a teacher, professor, and our chief executive science officer. Doc, welcome Ooh. to the show. <laughs> I think that's more words in my title than normal. <laughs> I just know. I, I got to fill a whole show with noise, and I thought... Why not make your title the beat? I didn't write anything down, so I'm just putting <laughs> words together and phrases. More uh, adjectives. <laughs> more adjectives, yeah. So tonight, today on the show, we're, we're, sorry, we're lucky. We've got uh, a best-selling author, Jonathan Balcom, coming on the show. He wrote the book, What a Fish Knows, where he makes a very strong case that fish are sentient, conscious beings, uh, and they deserve the same respect that we give to every other kind of animal, human, and pet we have. And Well, not every other kind of animal. More like mammals. Mammals. He does jump to mammals, doesn't he? Yeah. Because, I mean, he he's not arguing birds. that we should give them the same respect as the crickets in our backyard. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, <laughs> could, you write, could you write a book, what a cricket knows, or what, a, what an insect knows, and come out with the same, the same outcome? Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about that book before he comes on. We're going to talk with him when he comes on, if he shows up. And, and <laughs> If uh, he shows up. You know, he'll show up. Uh, <laughs> This is what he does. Uh, but this is for him. This is going to be interesting because where he's talking to a fishing audience and he is an anti-fisher. So um, I want to make sure that we show him respect and we hear his story and we ask him qu good questions, have some fun with him too. Well, that's interesting because I'm part of the show, but I also, as you know, I don't fish. You don't have to fish to love us. But you also know about whether or not I agree with this author. So right. I'm not yeah. going to tell the fans. They can, they're going to have to guess. <laughs> yeah, we can, we, <laughs> we can make a guess. But before we do that, Doc, you haven't been on the show in a while. I, well, I've been on the show, but it's the recordings that I actually did, I think, before Christmas. So you've been kind of yeah. sparing me out there so I didn't disappear. Yeah. I know. We hate that. You know, whenever, I get, whenever I get correspondent stuff, I always try to like, how can I sprinkle this through? Because we don't get nearly enough. <laughs> but, but you've been out of the recording mix for a while now because you've been very busy I have. working on your own spawn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, the bouncing baby Doc Martin. <laughs> yeah congratulations thank you and i'm not sure if this will be dropped next week but she's um seven weeks old right now i know this is seven <laughs> weeks are great because they're still cute you know they when they get to be seven years they get regular looking oh. you know my kids used to be cute now they're like normal looking kids and regular people kind of weird yeah so what's it like being a mom um i really like it um i think <laughs> you try to this is my first child, first of all, I guess. So going into this, you know, I have no idea. I've babysat my nephew a couple times, and that's about my whole experience. I was never a baby person as a teenager. I didn't ever want to babysit. I had I had way better things to do, apparently. Um, and so I'm trying to gauge, you know, I do a lot of publications. I do a lot of research. I am obviously a, a working person. Like, I, I love my job. And so one of those fears was that if I have the kid, I'm not going to be able to be myself. Like there'll be something else that I'm not going to be able to do anymore. And that's totally false. I've, yeah, it's just, you're, you're who you are plus one. And so I have a lot more fun during the day now. <laughs> so we, she's just starting to kind of babble and talk. And now when I read my books, I usually just read it out loud to her. She didn't care what she reads yet. And soon she will. <laughs> soon she will. Yeah. But she'll, I mean, kids adapt to whatever. We become like little, especially at first, little, little pictures of us. Like, mm -hmm. and they just, they all, and they want to be you, you know? So I know, do, what are your hopes for her? Like for, do you want her, do you, what do you want her to be when she grows up? So I have gotten a lot, of course, everyone assumes scientists, right? They're like, oh, they're going to be the next fish biologist. I get that I a lot. And yeah, a lot of the people have sent me like little fish onesies and fish books for babies and all that kind of stuff. And they go, oh, going to be a scientist like mommy when you grow up. And my old response is she will be whatever she wants when she grows up. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's what I say. So now though, I say I want my kids to be Doc Martin. Oh God! In fact, in <laughs> fact, in you, fact, they had, they did career day uh, during Spear Week at school for my kids' school, and they had to dress up of what they want to be when they grow up. Mm -hmm. And Zoe dressed up as a university professor, biologist. 
That's right. You sent me that picture. That was adorable. <laughs> she, she is so like bringing her to meet you for her changed her brain. It made her want to be like it, it, you're aspirational. She wants to be like you. Oh, that's so <laughs> sweet. <laughs> I'm so lame. <laughs> you want to live in Kansas? She goes, no, that's terrible. But but I don't want. But I want to be a professor. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> All right. So I what? Don't think what end up in Kansas, anyways? But no one, no one thinks they're going to end up in Kansas. Yeah, <laughs> no. the mysterious rectangle. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what fishy stuff have you been up to lately? Well, it's actually um, surprisingly been very productive. So, I've got three um, aquatic publications at various stages of review right now. Um, one was just accepted, I think, Monday last week, so a week ago. Um, accepted with minor revisions, which I've never actually gotten in a nationally uh, circulated journal before. So that was pretty exciting. And now what's a minor revision? What's that mean? Um, that means they're easy. Oh, great. so it's so, just like you had, we had four different reviewers that are professionals, you know, somewhere else in the United States and they read your paper and they critically evaluate it. As you can imagine, a lot of the times it's pretty intense and you have a lot of just, oh, well, you didn't mention this, or you didn't mention my paper, or oh, I'm very familiar with this, so you should cite these six papers and go read them and redo your whole introduction or your discussion, or why did you do the statistics this way? You should have done them this way, or I'm, I specialize in this statistical analysis. Why didn't you use that one? And you get a lot of pretty aggressive feedback, um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what I was expecting. That's usually what I get is just people really try and tend to hammer it in, which I guess if you're the kind of person that could cut you down, but it's always a learning experience for me. I view it as that's something that I didn't think about. So you know, if you're getting criticism, then I like to say, well, I must not have gotten my point across. So how can I do that better? Right. Smart. Yeah. Um, I usually get defensive and say, you're stupid. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I kind of yelled that maybe the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I was clear. I've had some uh, really mean reviewers in the past, but this one was great. I actually had one of the reviewers, reviewer number two, um, called my statistical analyses clever and elegant. And that was very exciting for me. So toot my own horn a little bit there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Congratulations. So so topically, are you allowed to share what the topics are these? Or do you just know Um, I can... Well, so two of them uh, deal with the microplastics project that I did with my students last fall. Mm-hmm. Very important work. Yes, and that's actually been really exciting. So um, I got two publications out of that because, well, first, I'm a teacher and also a researcher, right? So one of the publications is going to, I don't know if I can say the journal, so maybe I won't, but a, a journal. A journal <laughs> dealing with teaching. <laughs> and, um, It's basically like a lesson plan, like tips and tricks. So if any other professor, I kind of geared it through high school students or university students. So either level, if they wanted to do something similar, you know, how did I come up with the idea? How did I execute the idea? You know, what was the basic budget for this? What was the timeline? Um, What were the different requirements I made for my students? And then overall, what was the student response? You know, was this actually worth it? Did I improve my classroom by doing this? Uh, I yes, I feel like I did. <laughs> Congratulations! Yeah, and then uh, the other I publication. I was like, of course they got better. It was me. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but and the other publication is the one actually written by the students with their data. So that's the actual. It's kind of science manuscript, not so much. The so paper. so the students are getting published. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. They did the work, and that feels good for them. Hopefully, motivates them to keep doing the work. I hope so. I know um, some of the feedback I got was really nice. Like I had some students write on their final exams, like how much they really appreciated a professor being that involved and, you know, obviously caring and doing something so unique. Um, I had two other students enroll in a couple of my other classes. And then um, I got one freshman, which is really exciting to enroll voluntarily in the ecology journal club discussions and so that's a really great thing for particularly undergraduates although it's mostly graduate students that attend and every week we pick a recent scientific publication in the field of ecology not necessarily fish it could be anything there's nothing else there's nothing else (laughs) and we read it and then we discuss it so it's a bunch of professors and students that get together and critically evaluate this piece of literature 
And so a freshman coming in, first of all, that's very intimidating, but that's really, really good for them. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. And, and so the nice thing about so this, this microplastic thing, Jonathan Balcom's very big on microplastics. Oh, There's, okay. He talks about it. He shows pictures of fish or egg eaters who eat mm-hmm. little microplastic beads and it gets yep. in our system, gums them up. So we have some common, we all agree this is bad. So we can, yes, you know, we, we have that. Very bad. So, you know, see, I'm trying to connect to everything. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell I'm nervous about this interview? I'm never nervous about interviews. And this one has got me in a like. You, I think you were I nervous for the other interview. Maybe I forget. I think when they forgot. go well, I'm not nervous anymore. <laughs> It's when I think maybe am I going to be wrong? Am I going to oh. say something dumb? Which I always do. <laughs> so, and so let's talk a little bit. We got about sure. ten minutes before Jonathan comes on. Mm-hmm. Why don't we give our book review for this book, What a Fish Knows, before we talk to him? Okay, sure. Um, do you do you want to go first or second? Well, we can just kind of have a conversation about. Okay. It, so don't have to, I don't have anything written down. I Me am going to read. I am going to read our the Effin Library and Jeff Donaldson. I uh, could oh, not yes. be here today because he's afraid. Um, but he uh, he he sent a statement. I'm going to read that to Jonathan. I'm not going to read that now. Okay. Uh, but I'll give you. So my my first impression of this is this book has come up in nearly every author interview I've done over the last five years. Since it came out, 2016, whatever. Yeah, 2016. Up. So this book comes up over and over and over again. It gets recommended to me by scientists, recommended by lay people, recommended to me by uh, anti fishers. Uh, and it gets critiqued all over the place. Like people are like either, yeah, he's right on the money. Don't ever eat a fish again. Or that guy's crazy. Fish don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of reluctant to even want to read it. And then I, I think it was Jeff said, why don't you reach out to him one more time? Because I have. Uh, and I, so I did. And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And like, that was easy. So now uh-huh. I had to read the book. And I, and <laughs> yeah, so that, that's why. But you read it when it came out. I did. Yeah. Uh, well, it was what a fish knows. And um, I know this is shocking, but I read a lot of books. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, so this came up on something like suggested for you on Amazon or whatever. Um, and I immediately bought it because this is something that I, I like to think about. I think it's just genuinely interesting. It is. Um, and I did. I read it in Gosh, I read it on my way to the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists Conference in 2016 down in New Orleans. Perfect. Um, And I think I opened it up and I finished it on the trip down there. Like it was really good. It's it's very easy to read, even though it's packed full of information, which I really appreciated. What I what I really liked about this book was first of all, yeah, easy to read because I'm not I'm not as smart as most readers. (laughs) Uh, But what I he did a great job of. Of, of mixing anecdotes with science. Mm-hmm. So it had a flow to it, almost like a story arc. And I found that as, as he was saying in the book, I'm not going to go through the details of the book because we'll talk about that with him live. But as he was making a case for something, just when I was saying, but what about the next chapter was the what about? It, it mm-hmm. just grabbed that next thought I was having. It was like he knew I was reading it and I wasn't going to believe him. And he was anticipating my what abouts. Yep. Uh, to the point where I got annoyed with him after a while. I'm like, oh, of course, <laughs> that's what you're doing next. Of course. <laughs> yeah, duh. You knew I was going to ask that. Yeah. So you actually, you read this very recently. I, well, I, I actually, I just finished a prologue about 15 minutes ago. The prologue, the epilogue. Oh, so okay. <laughs> about 15 minutes ago. In fact, I'm not sure I finished it. I think I'm nearly done now. So, yeah. So yeah. The, my, th- what, three years ago and you're just fresh out the book. So fresh, but no notes. I just no, nope. I don't have any notes no. either. It's just no. from what I remember three years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I've thought about it and have discussions about it since then. So you know, there's that. Yeah. But he does a really good job. And and in this book, he's really trying to make a case for sentience. So mm-hmm. they know that they're like individuals, not just a group of fishes acting as a collective, which is how we Oh, usually- I remember the example he used for that. The spe- uh, some of the species, that was a good one. Well, he well he talked a lot about cichlids. Where like his like throughout the entire book, that was like his thing and rasses mm-hmm. and all these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the chapter on sex in this book, it's it's so good that I'm gonna like be able to pull it apart and use it when I do presentations and stuff because it's it's all the stuff I love talking about, like the mouth brooders and all that stuff. But what I found is is and I'm gonna tell, I'm not gonna say I don't know what I found in this book was was fish behavior being interpreted as a thoughtful process. Mm-hmm. Is, is that's what I saw a lot of in the book was like these great adaptations, but are the, are adaptations actually thoughts? And, and that's kind or, of where or, the discussion is going to go, I think. 
I think that's where it's going to have to go because every one of his fish descriptions of behaviors are totally real things that we can but observe. The fish do that. And, yep. They totally do those things. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, when we start inserting what their meanings are or why they do it, that's where it gets kind of mm -hmm. where I go, hmm, that, your story makes sense, but does that make it right? You know, and that's the hard part. So are we after, after this, we're going to have a conversation about whether or not humans actually have free will, right? Well, as, as <laughs> I started, I, 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 I've, I started behaviorism in college and oh, good. I, I, I actually don't think that we do. <laughs> nope, I actually don't either. So I, I think we all are, are, are victims of, uh, of classical conditioning. So there we're offering conditioning. <laughs> so even I studied, I studied cognition and behavioral, um, psychology in college. So, uh, and I, after reading that, I talked to a couple of behaviorists who, no matter what you said to them, if that was free will, they had a way of explaining it as pure, pure, uh, you know, what do you call it? Uh, conditioning. Yeah. Sorry. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so smart. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's a really good conversation to have. Does mm -hmm. anyone have does, as free will a thing that anyone deals with? Yep. Yeah. So how, then, how thoughtful are our decisions then? Yeah, or, you know, well, then we get into ethicals, right? So we know what mm -hmm. fish do, right? Mm -hmm. And so people eating fish might be considered evil by some or hurtful by sentient beings. Are fish that eat each other evil? Can we eat the ones that are evil? You know, because then, well, we're just taking the evil ones away. So the top predators, are they just evil? The because they, just the piscivores, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so like it's, it gets... What it gets about weird. the insectivores? Well, the question is, do insects have feelings? <sighs> Yeah. That's the next yeah. one. Now he talks in this book I, about, oh, go ahead. Well, then we get to plants and I've also read, I'm not going to say convincing research, but I've also read some things that say that plants have feelings too. So. Why not? Well, so <laughs> the book didn't get into this, but one of the things I always think about when I'm talking about like sex with stuff, mm -hmm. so I'm talking about, I always talk about sex. I always come back to sex. <laughs> is is a, This book has a whole chapter on, on fish sex and the fish behavior, the things that you go through to get to make fish babies. Mm -hmm. And what it doesn't say is, is humans are the only, the only animals that have sex with intent of making babies. Every other animal does it because it feels good. Where we often think that human, like every other animal, the goal is reproduction. I think mm -hmm. they don't have, I don't have any idea what the outcome is going to be. I think they're doing it because it feels good and fish do it and humans do it for both reasons. And with intent. And along with that is uh, when you teach about reproduction, of course, most animals will eat the placenta. A lot of the mammals do. Yeah. And why do they do that? And you can say, oh, it's nutritious and da 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 It's because it tastes good. It must taste good yeah, because they're not thinking in terms of nutrition, right? Right. They're not, they're not saying, oh, this is very high and da 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 Like, no, it's there and it tastes good. That's what they're doing. <laughs> right. And I think that – and so we look at all these things and you consider, okay, so – I just said sex feels good. That means things can feel bad. That means, so if a fish is having sex because it feels good, mm -hmm. um, does feeling, is feeling bad a thing also? And then we jump right back into that, what a fish knows mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Right. And then of course, you know, just because there's a good and a bad, does that feeling parallel with the human experience? Right. Does it, and that's the, the big jump here. It's the ethics and the parallels. Yeah. Is it as the same yeah, like is my good, your good, right? And you, gosh, we have trouble being empathetic with other humans. Well, being empathetic with a fish is a whole other challenge, right? Well, and one of you know, pain is a big one for fish because you know the hooks and all that stuff. Well, pain for humans is really terrible. You know the, the little pain scale with the smiley faces in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. So you know, my eight might be your two. Nope. Your eight is my 45. Like I am <laughs> such a wuss. I am. You, but, you made a baby. <laughs> Believe me. You're I did. I will say that um, that is definitely the highest pain scale. <laughs> did you? Uh, yeah. Can I ask you a person? Did you have natural childbirth? Um, as natural as we could get, but I, I did have an epidural. Good and, on you. Um, yeah. when, because of how the birth went, which uh -huh. was, it ended up being, Relatively easy, but not totally easy to leave out some details. Um, okay, thank you. I looked over at the nurse <laughs> and I, was, I just was like, I'm really glad I got an epidural. And she looks at me and she goes, yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> so there my, you go. <laughs> my, my wife my wife delivered both babies with nothing. 
and uh, it, she does not remember the pain. That's why she wanted to have a second one. Mm -hmm. And so I think if humans can remember pain, no one would ever more, more than one baby, right? If we can remember pain the way that it really feels. <laughs> and I, I also wonder, does that pain switch in our brain? We can't remember the exact pain, like how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Does that exist in all animals? That pain switch. We can't remember the pain the way it really was. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's why you catch the same fish over and over and over again because it's a short memory of pain. And does memory of pain matter? Like, how long does it hurt? If it hurts for a second, but you forget about it. Mm -hmm. Does it count? Ear piercing? Would you pierce your ears thirty times or just once? You I got forget. eight. Eight. So you love it. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I like the look. <laughs> <laughs> maybe fish like the look of the hook in their lip. <laughs> well, because I mean, if if we can, oh, I think Jonathan's here. Hey, all right, yeah, it's about time. Yeah, he's right Three on time. Minutes. Yeah, he's just logging in. Looks like we're just talking about fish piercings. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. Hey, you look like you. Hey, nice to meet you. Good to yeah, meet you too. Nice to meet thanks you. for doing this. Sure. Thanks for having me. All right. So we're super lucky. Jonathan Balcom's here, and we talked about him for the last 20 minutes. But he's here to talk about his book, What a Fish Knows. Doc Martin is here to help translate science into real life for my brain because I can't always know what she knows. Uh, and together, we're going to be able to hopefully get Jonathan's message out to the Fish Nerds Nation and start some more conversations about this because it's an important topic. Uh, it's, it's a confusing topic. And uh, Jonathan, before I let you talk, I'm going to tell you that uh, I read this book and I didn't think I was going to love it. And I absolutely loved the book. I thought the writing was stunning. The way that you were able to take the scientific um, perspective, the anecdotes and tell people's personal stories. And it almost felt like the book had an arc, even though it was just a kind of straightforward, straight across book. So anyway, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Clayton. Thanks for the, the uh, positive comments on my book. Yeah, I'm sure you've got all kinds of comments on this because it's a controversial topic, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 So before we jump in the book, can you can you tell us what inspired you to write the book? What a fish knows. Like, what about this idea, like, resonated with you? Well, I've always been a lover of animals and fascinated by them from my earliest age. And like most kids, I had my experiences with contact with fish, be it uh, trying out fishing, which I never really took to, or you know, moving a, a goldfish from one classroom to another when I was in fourth grade and dropping the bow, which smashed on the floor. That I, I relate sorry. that story in the book. Oh, that was traumatic. <laughs> So, you know, I had my contact with fish and then growing up to be a biologist, I took an ichthyology course in my undergraduate biology degree and realized the incredible diversity of these creatures. And then, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't focus my energies on fish. In fact, I did my graduate work on behavior in bats and then, and then worked in the animal field, uh, animal protection for many years. And then I was having lunch with a friend a few years ago and I was, I was going to say fishing for a new book topic. And, and I did say that. And uh, and I realized, you know, the that's that's a that's a subject that I really felt needed addressing. I knew there was great science on what fish do, and most people still kind of labored under the the old bias that um, fishes were kind of unlink, unthinking, unfeeling things. Uh, and I knew the science and the biology showed otherwise. So I wanted to bring that to light in this book. Well, you, you certainly did a lot of that. And and just before I go any further, uh, we have a Fish Nerds librarian named Jeff Townsend. We call him the FN librarian. He's the one who started the Fish Nerds Book Club. And he's the one who said we should talk about this book on the show. And he couldn't be here today because he's working. Uh, but he did write up a, a little statement. I'm going to read this to you, and I want to get your reflection on this, okay? So can you hear me okay? All right, this, is, this is his comments on what a fish knows. Very few books have had as powerful an impact on me as this book. I already knew that fish could exhibit very complex behavior, have amazing abilities, and are capable of learning. I had also come around to the idea that fish do indeed feel pain, but the question of exactly what the fish's subjective experience of pain is like I have always found much more difficult to answer. Dr. Balcom's impassionate case that fish are fully sentient, conscious beings capable of the kind of suffering comparable to, say, a dog, really hit me hard. <laughs> it's not catching, killing fish to eat, this book that caused me to question, although as inform my thoughts on the proper way to kill a fish, as I am also a hunter, but rather recreational catch and release angling. This hit me so hard, I literally had an existential crisis over the issue. These days, unless I'm fishing for food, I mostly fly fish uh, using strictly barbless hooks and following the more rigorous standards of handling fish to be released. 
I hadn't much thought about what the fish experienced during the process other than the pain of mouth followed by a force pulling to the surface and attempt to escape. In light of this book, I have to ask, are the fish experiencing something akin to a human emotion of terror? Are the fish prematurely trauma uh, permanently, permanently traumatized by the interactions? I don't know. And I'm not sure that anyone can truly answer these questions without being a fish. In the end, I will continue to fish for both food and sport, but we'll also continue to wrestle with the ethical issues of these. I'm sure if Dr. Balcom and I would fundamentally disagree on the relationship between fish and other animals and humans. Uh, he's a vegan and I've killed large wild mammals for the purpose of eating them. In the end, I will continue to fish for food but also continue to wrestle with the ethical issue of catching, killing, and releasing these fish um, instead of treating them like meat robots. What, uh, what do you say to somebody who's like struggling with this? I read the book and they fished all their whole life and now they're like, oh gosh, now what? What am I doing? Well, it's a very thoughtful statement from a yeah. reader. And um, in indeed, the reader is, is correct that we can never ultimately know what's going on inside another creature. Um, that's the privacy challenge. Uh, it's considered the hard problem of science. Uh, indeed, I can't know how Clay Groves is feeling right now exactly. He may tell me he's feeling uh, happy or he's feeling True. stressed. <laughs> but he could be a robot from outer space or he could be lying. So <laughs> uh, between our own species, of course, we generally accept that the person is not lying and mm -hmm. they are actually feeling that feeling. And we usually can relate because A, the verbal report, but also B, I've had that feeling before and I know what it's like. So you know, we do have that upper hand. We have that advantage. How, how do we tell how a dog's feeling? Well, dogs have been manipulating us for 15,000 years. We may be able to grasp quite a bit of what they're feeling based on that long experience. But a fish, an animal who doesn't bl blink, who makes sounds underwater, but we don't hear them. An animal who um, is just ev has evolved in such a different milieu living underwater. Um, it's tougher to relate. But what we can do is we can look at science. We can look at behavior. Uh, we can look at um, physiology. We can see how stress hormones are present, and a lot of their biochemistry is the same as ours. And uh, we can do studies like st uh, surgeon fish who were stressed by putting being put in a bucket of shallow water for half an hour, and then they were given an opportunity to get stroked by a, by a, a model fish that actually in the wild does deliver strokes when they're at cleaning stations. That's another separate story. But the the one these stressed fish would swim up next to that next to that model and, and get stroked by by that uh, model uh, many times during the hour that they were in there. And you can measure the stress hormones and they went down when that happened. Uh, control fish put in a tank with a, a, a model fish that wasn't moving and couldn't give them strokes. They ignored it. They didn't swim up next to it because they couldn't get the massage and they couldn't get that stress relief. So that's an example of a, of a compelling study that I think says a lot about the inner lives of these creatures and says that it's more complex than we think and that they can have stress and they have the wherewithal to get stress relief if they're given the opportunity. Uh, so, you know, my book was, was partly written to bring to light, as I say, th these, these kind of studies that show that there's so much more going on inside a fish than, than we used to think. Doc, do you want to jump in? Oh, I've just been letting this happen. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, hi, it's nice to meet you, Dr. Balcom. So, yeah, I'm. Thank you, Erica. You can call me Jonathan, please. Okay. Jonathan? You must call um, her Doc Martin. No. Okay. <laughs> Doc Martin. I want to see your boots. <laughs> you can call me Erica. That's totally fine. Um, and so, I've actually I've done ichthyology and I'm a professor out here in Kansas. Um, Nothing nearly as fancy uh, as writing a book or anything like that, but I am a fish enthusiast. Um, I just think in general, the book was really enjoyable. So I actually got it uh, on right away in 2016. I think I just sat down. I read the whole thing. I, it was really, really well written. I, I genuinely enjoyed the book. Um, I don't keep books. Uh, what I do is if I enjoy the book, I put it in a box and I bring it to a party to let other people enjoy. So it's floating around somewhere for someone else to enjoy. Good for you. Um, uh, so the, the fans already know this, but you don't know this, is that I don't fish. Uh, I like to watch the fish. I think just appreciating them and what they're doing in the environment, uh, that's a lot more my style. I don't care to go hunting or fishing. Um, when we talk about fish feelings, um, you know, part of me, I'm, I'm, I'm all down for that. I think that's great. I think it's, there's a beauty to it to say that, you know, these fish are complex animals. I definitely agree with that. Um, a lot of the research that you have in the book is stuff that, you know, I'm more or less familiar with depending on which topic we're talking about. Um, and I guess one of my questions was you're very confident, which I really appreciate. Um, 
to make the leap that these fish are definitely feeling things like they, yes, pain, there's the stress hormones and things like that, that it, I'm not going to argue with that at all. Um, my question is, you seem really confident that the way that they have the feelings of pain or their experiences can be paralleled to the human experience, that we can understand that in some way. And I would like you to maybe talk a little bit more about how you feel so confident, like what makes you really believe that that's the case? It's something that we can understand. Yeah, um, I guess the way you put it, that can be paralleled. I, I don't take issue with that language. I think that's a fair way of characterizing my view can be paralleled uh, and and I want to I want to I want to you know the way I see that phrase is we can liken it at some level uh, I I don't know you know back to the privacy thing we don't know how they feel and I don't know and they are dramatically different than us in some ways and they're dramatically alike us in other ways they have all the organ systems they they're vertebrates you know they they can move away from bad things and towards good things and they've been evolving for 400 million years so they've got a lot and you know we think they're primitive but of course you and I know probably Clay knows, these are not primitive animals. They've continued to evolve. They've just been very successful at what they do. So they've sometimes remained unchanged for long periods. But as to how we define, you know, their experiences are, are parallel, I don't want to sound cocky or overconfident in that. I, I, I don't know any, any more than anyone else does. I can look at the science. What I can find is that the science shows that there is sentience there. There is consciousness. There's what looks like awareness. We now have a recent study of mirror self-recognition by a small fish, the cleaner ass, um, you know, that to me says, that speaks to uh, self-awareness or a level of cognitive, a level of a life, a level of engagement with oneself. Let's, let's, is, let's, can we talk about that cleaner ass for a second? Sure. So, so, we actually uh, featured that paper. We, on we have talked topic. about this, but I, for, 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 for new listeners may not know the, this, what the sentient test is. And that's basically where they put a mirror up in front of an animal and they put something on the animal. If the animal tries to get it off, that's a sign of like self-awareness. I think with the cleaner ass, there was like a blue dot or something. I can't remember anymore what it was, but that's essentially what the test is. It's do you recognize yourself in a mirror and will you try to like remove something on your skin based on reflection of yourself? Does that sound close? Yeah, that's good. I mean, <laughs> it's not the only measure of uh, test of sentience, but it's certainly one test of a, what's regarded as a pretty high level of sentience, that is to say self-awareness. If the animal does a threat display or looks behind the mirror or does something that suggests doesn't recognize him or herself in the mirror, then it suggests maybe there isn't self-awareness. Although I like to say an animal who fails the mirror self-recognition test, I don't think that means they're not self-aware. I mean, dogs failed it repeatedly and then someone had the idea, oh, let's test them on smells. Mm. They, they're much more scent oriented and lo and behold uh, they uh, they did much better in that kind of paradigm so yeah, and that's actually something uh, that we talked about when we did that is just because an animal fails it doesn't mean that that they are not or have no potential to be because our experience is the mirror test works really well we've got really good eyes yeah so that makes a lot of sense that that's something that's important to us but that's and not we, necessarily a good measure for other animals and right. we practice using mirrors our whole life so like right. <laughs> animals don't yes. play in front of mirrors <laughs> and, and one of the good designs part of the design of that study was that they did give the the, the fish i think it was several days experience with the mirrors mm -hmm. to, so they could get used to the concept they could get used to the presence of this uh, mirror in their environment and that's an important step yeah, I think when we read it, was it still under peer review? They had released it to the public for comment before they actually submitted it, I think. Yeah, been it was. It just year. barely came out when we talked mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, so you, I'd be we interested have to see the, the final product. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, back to your question, Erica, you know, quite, quite aside from how, how similar their experience of their life is than ours, I think what we what I, well, what I'm comfortable conclu concluding from the science is that uh, they're not just alive, they have a life. Uh, they have experiences. They have, I like the way one philosopher put it, not just a biology, but a biography. Mm -hmm. These are individuals with uh, lives that uh, they value. They try and escape bad things and, and they, uh, they approach and welcome in their lives good things like food and shelter and protection and safety and that sort of thing. So uh, on that level, I think we do owe, it, owe them some concern and consideration uh, and some respect. And that's just, if I can, if I can, get a reader to, to budge an inch on that, then I feel like I've, I've done something worthwhile. Well, it's it's interesting challenge because you know fisher people, right? I'm mostly fisher men. I'm going to be sexist for a minute because fisher men are like, they're hard asses. They I'm not going to change for anything. going to pry this rod out of my hand, my cold, dead hands. I mean, it really is a fisher men attitude. We have very, it's a very macho space. 
uh, and a very, I want to say, very killy space. I'm sure people like to kill a lot of things. So changing them is 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 going to be a challenge. Uh, now, this audience, the fish nerds audience, mostly are fisher people, um, not, not just fisher men, and a little more, th- I like to think fish nerds audience is a little more thoughtful than most fishing uh, people. Uh, so I think that you can't, you will be reaching people with this who maybe otherwise would see your title of the book and see the concept and right away just shut it down. Like, that's impossible. No way. I ignore the whole thing. Um, but I'm going to back up a little bit, though, because when I, my first impression of this book after um, not, not seeing the title, but after actually reading the first chapter, your definition of fish is bar none, the best definition of fish I've ever read in my life. Like I often stand in front of an audience and I do a lot of speaking and I start off by telling people to give me three traits that all fish have in common. We do this game and they can't do it. And your book de- demonstrated that same concept, the diversity of traits that fish have, how basically they don't fit in any category at all. So we call them fish and put them in a big box. And I loved how you, everything about, it was like reading poetry for me. I got a little teary. I was like, yes, right on. It's so good. He, he was well, fangirling over it. I was it such a fan. You, yeah, I'm such a, I love it. Tuned in. <laughs> I have a brother who fishes, and frankly, I, I think he's a pretty sensitive guy. I haven't been in the boat with him uh, fishing, so maybe that maybe I'd have a different view after that experience. Uh, um, but uh, you know, I know I know that fishermen, just like any other cohort in society, are a mixed bunch, and while some may fit the kind of more rough and ready description you gave them. I know that there's a lot of very thoughtful ones. I talked to some while I was researching my book and I've heard from some since I wrote it. So, Yeah, they're a pretty diverse group, but I, there are a bunch of, maybe you don't, you don't know them well because they wouldn't hang out with you, but there's a bunch that would just <laughs> shut you down. But um, I, I liked it. And can you give us, um, when in your, your chapter on sex, fixed sex is my favorite thing to talk about because they do so many cool things. Um, in fact, I was just on a a radio show last week and I did top 10 fishy moms. And I talked about some of the same fish you talked. I talked about, about the finding Nemo story. I talked about the mouth brooders and all that. Can you take us through your favorite fish sex story and talk about how that relates to fishing, fish's emotions or fishing feelings? Uh, cause um, you, you do is you connect these things so well. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. I need to go to my notes on, on sex lives. Um, <laughs> I, know that, I know I have a note here. Size matters in mosquito fish that, all right, well, I'll just tell that one. It's, it's that. not exactly fish having sex, but uh, I actually had my first exposure to this, this part of fish biology and fish sex. When I was a, an undergraduate, we, we took an animal behavior course and we had guppies in the classroom, you know, guppies, popular little colorful fish and the males have big showy tails. And they show off, you know, they do these sigmoidals where they arch their bodies and they, and they vibrate their tail in an alluring fashion. But they also have, um, they also have a gonopodium, which is basically a fish, a fish dong, a fish penis uh, that's, that's hanging off the bottom of their body. And it's huge. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they, that's a huge, relatively speaking for them, you know, <laughs> any male, any male human would be envious based on their proportions. <laughs> But uh, they swing it around, you know, they can swing it around and, and move it around. And I remember that we call them gonopodial swings. And I think that was a formal term. I don't know if Eric is familiar with this term, but um, uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's a cloacal gaping or anything other that goes on in uh, in uh, in the females. But anyway, the males do these gonopodial swings and these fancy sigmoidals and the tail quivers. And, um, you know, it speaks to the, the, the energetic engagement they have, the courtship that they have. And courtship varies widely on, among fish. Uh, some readers and some listeners may know that th- some fish can change sex in a very short period of time, just hours or days. No expensive surgery required. It's a very handy adaptation. But, um, you know, the gonopodium is, a, is an intermittent organ, organ. So there is uh, many fish are known to just, you know, s- spread their sperm and their eggs in the water and they... They meet in the water, um, but uh, some fish do have in, intermittent sex, do have penetrative sex, and that's something worth knowing for a species like ours. And it's really important. I'm, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was with my daughter two days ago. We were looking at a Facebook page, and Greenland has a whale penis museum, or Iceland, where there's this whole museum of these giant whale penises. And my younger daughter, who's nine, and my, my 12-year-old and I were all laughing about this, and my my older daughter goes, oh, now they can't pee. And my younger one goes, and they can't make babies. And my older one says, wait a minute, you need a penis to make a baby? And I went, oh. And I said, what did, what did we talk about? She goes, well, you used fish to explain sex to me. And we went to the salmon hatchery and you 
you squeezed out eggs and sperm into a bowl and mixed it together. And I said to you, is that how people make babies? And you said, yes. And so that's where I stopped asking questions. <laughs> so you should, you should remind me of that story. So I, now I could use guppies now as my <laughs> way of describing sex to my kids now, next time. But I have a doc, when you have, when your kid gets older, let me talk to your kid about sex. <laughs> <laughs> you and John King. No. <laughs> Oh, that's so fun. Um, now, uh, <laughs> Jonathan, so in your book, too, you make you make a lot of great you tell a lot of great stories about fish and about fish and fishing behavior. And you use a lot of aquarium um, like novice aquarists talk about like their Oscars and stuff and how they have personalities. Can you speak to how a pet fish's personality, which one might argue is just classical conditionings, is actually real deep emotional feelings and how you've interpreted that? Well, I relate a number of personal anecdotes in my book. I reached out to people who I knew or people who I didn't know um, to get uh, stories, to get their own impressions, their own experiences with their pet Oscar or their pet discuses or what have you. I went to a couple of homes to, to see these animals in some cases. Um, you know, a couple that that, that that caught me was one woman in the Northwest, uh, I think Seattle area, had a, a nine-year-old p- uh, pufferfish, a very small species, uh, and they're predacious. You it, from what she tells me, you pretty much can't keep them with another fish in their tank because they'll tend to kill and eat them. So uh, Mango lived alone, and she would Mango. She would greet Mango when she came home every day, and she sent me a fantastic picture. It's in the book of them looking at each other through the the aquarium glass, and it's these two universes separated by glass, and yet you see a connection between those that glass between those two universes. You puffer fishes are you know have binocular vision like we do. The eyes are at the front of the face. Very useful for cute. a predator. Yeah, and very cute, exactly. I mean, this little creature. I, I was I was in touch recently with the woman who who had him, and he lived another couple of years, but he died at age eleven a couple of years ago or a year ago. Uh, so he's no longer. But um, you know, there was definitely a connection, and and there's just numerous anecdotes. I give a couple in the book of individual fish who recognize individual humans. And since the book was published, a study I think from Germany has confirmed what people had suspected all along, which is that fish can recognize it, individual humans by our faces. Um, and remember us. And so those those anecdotes, there's another one, a woman who'd come home from work and with her discus, um, she'd cup her hands and the discus would swim into her hands and she'd stroke this fish. And, you know, there was a time when someone could just look at me and laugh. But now we have this thing called YouTube and you can go in online and you can you can type in, you know, fish play or man, man strokes fish or whatever. And you'll You'll find um, you'll find some uh, compelling videos on there of fish uh, trusting humans, and you can clearly see them trusting and swimming back for more. You know, it just it really makes you scratch your head and, and think. You know, am I looking at a fish? Because it really is at odds with the old uh, stereotypes we've had against these creatures. Doc, you want to add anything to that? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add particularly. I know when I worked at the pet store, when I was finishing my dissertation, we had a puffer fish and, you know, I scratch his belly and he'd come to me if I wanted to feed him. And, you know, we, I don't know if I would consider that being any kind of personality that's a little bit hard pressed for me because it's like, well, I'm the one that fed him for a bunch of months. Um, if I went back there today, now that it's been five years, would that be enough to remember? Yeah, oh, that'd be a great not? test to see uh, long-term <laughs> recognition. I don't know if anyone's actually tested that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's personality. I mean, there's, it's another study that came out subsequent to my book is a, is a study of personality. It wasn't the first time someone had looked at that in fish. But, you know, the biological definition, as I recall it, from at least in this study, a basic definition of personality is a, is, a, is different behavioral traits between individuals that are, that are persistent through time. And they did this with guppies, the same ones with the gonopodium we were talking about a minute ago. And uh, they found that different guppies, when presented with threats, such as a, a fake plastic mm-hmm. heron that Old stabbed shark. into the water, right, or mm-hmm. a big predatory fish, tilapia, what have you, the, some of them would freeze, and some of them would flee, and some of them maybe make a threat or whatever. But mm-hmm. those individuals, the fleer, would flee every time yep. and, and, in, in different circumstances, and the one who would freeze would tend to freeze over time. So uh, they define that as, as personality. Once again, Erica, back to your earlier point of, of parallels, mm-hmm. I'm not making the claim that these animals have personalities of, of, a, of a level of complexity that we do. Right. Not to say we know they don't, but you know we don't need to claim, claim that, I don't think. I think the point is here that, we, that fishes are individuals, um, and they're not all just 
cut from the same cloth, so to speak. Um, going along these lines, and an- another example is um, migration in some fishes. I- I'm familiar with riverine fishes down in New Mexico. Um, you have some that are stayers and some that are goers. So you'll have some that'll travel up and down uh, the river just into different places. Um, and then you'll have some that'll just stay in the same pool forever. And it tends to be, you know, the ones that move, move, and the ones that don't, don't. Um, so that's kind of similar to the bold shy in the guppies there, um, which is another, maybe, you know, is that a personality? I mean, based on the really basic definition, you'd help. I, yes, it is. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, that kind of variation is, is what we expect everywhere in nature anyway, and maybe not mm-hmm. personalities in say crickets or grasshoppers, although I wouldn't count that out. Um, but, uh, you know, natural selection, evolution by natural selection, which is, you know, accepted among scientists today is, is not really a, a theory anymore. It's kind of a scientific, uh, a law of nature. Uh, if the, if everyone's the same, there's nothing to select among. So, of course, variation is intrinsic to the proper functioning of nature over time. Mm-hmm. And um, along that, just these these different parallels. Um, now, it's been a few years since I've read your book. So if I'm misinterpreting it, please tell me. But it seems a lot of pretty heavy anthropomorphism does come through in your book, especially in the forms of the anecdotes, which is understandable because without the anecdotes, that science is a little bit hard to swallow. You know, you want someone that's reading it to know well, how does the science actually translate in the real world? And so that's where these anecdotes come in. Um, my question is, when you compare those kinds of uh, behaviors and traits and diversity to kind of these human emotions and human experiences, are you limiting yourself? Because the human experience is just this one thing. It's the only thing that we know. I mean, if we didn't do that, if we didn't assume that or make it about us, they could be doing something we can't ever, couldn't ever understand. Maybe some, maybe we could eventually, but it could be something just absolutely fantastic. And so this could be one way to like, maybe limit it. It could be even better than what we experience. Does that make sense? Uh, Yes, it does. And it's a great point. I mean, we are trapped in our humanness and uh, we do well to try to break free of those shackles and think think laterally, think creatively and allow ourselves to step back and say, look, this, this animal... Maybe we maybe want to say it's simpler than us, but it, but what we need to really realize is it's different, and mm-hmm. that differentness can manifest in some uh, surprising ways. Uh, let's be open-minded. Um, having said that, uh, nevertheless, I, I and I agree with you that the anecdotes sort of do kind of like have a little bit of a, a feeling of uh, they're like us; they're just little humans. That's certainly not my intention uh, in in doing that, and I hope that the science which goes with the anecdotes. Um, helps to override that. As you say, I, I've learned as a science writer and a writer of popular science books that people people love stories. We just love stories. And so those personal accounts, the science can get up here, but if you want to get here, uh, often it's those personal accounts, uh, the half a bathing suit story and the, and the puffer <laughs> fish story and stuff like that. But um, you know, some of the some of the most compelling studies are ones where we do very get much get caught up in our own humanness, and we kind of compare them to us. Uh, two examples would be the fact that that fishes, when they're tested on optical illusions that we fall for, they also fall for them. I find that extremely um, interesting and and arguably poignant. Uh, it suggests to me that a fish. Uh, it tells me that a fish can have beliefs and that those beliefs can be fallible. They think that one orange dot is bigger than the other orange dot, even though they're the same size. Um, and and we, we fall for the same optical illusion. And then another study was one with, back with the, the cleaner wrasse who uh, passed this mirror self-recognition test. When they're presented with ephemeral food that's going to be taken away if it's on a blue plate and the red plate food stays, they learn after 40 or so trials to take food from the red plate first because it's going to go away. And then they have all the time in the world to eat from the blue plate. That doesn't sound like such rocket science for our minds. Uh, but for chimpanzees, it's it's a tough problem. They they couldn't solve it as nearly as well as the fish could. The fish the fish solved it sooner than the than the chimps did. Um, the orangutans, I believe, were also tested. Capuchin monkeys. These are smarties. Uh, the animal. Are came. they are they still using the red and blue plate 
phenomenon for all those I, you know i believe they did they used the same paradigm they they, uh, they had to present it a little bit differently of course because the rats are in the water right uh, but well, i was just wondering and this might be something that you know because you study primates i believe right is that correct uh well Ish. i don't i'm not like a primatologist per se I, i'm kind of okay. a generalist i study everybody but i'm studying secondhand i'm mostly studying the science that other people have done okay so i was just thinking about how the eye works evolutionarily and i would i would say you know things that deal with color would not be necessarily surprising to me based on the evolution of the fish eye versus the human eye there's a lot of again parallels there so the their reaction to similar things the way that they view it isn't necessarily too shocking i think sure well i think you know this but this study isn't so much about color as it is about um, recognizing the the cognitive feat of recognizing that one stimulus is a, is ephemeral it's short lived it's going to be taken away in a minute so it makes sense to eat from that first. And, and really, frankly, I thought the fish were a bit slow on solving it, but they were a lot faster than the chimps, the orangutans, the capuchin monkeys, and the four-year-old daughter of one of the scientists who did the study. And, I, and I, you know, people relate to that because we like to compare. We love to, mm -hmm. we're fascinated by anything that compares the human to the non-human. And that one, of course, is a little bit eye-opening because the, the fishes actually did better than the, than the primates in that study. Um, do you know how long, so I know in the RAS study, they let the fish get used to the mirror because that's something that's new to them um, for several days. I don't remember how long. Yeah, Do you seven. know, because um, obviously chimps or whatever primate you want to choose also wouldn't be familiar with mirrors. Um, how long do they get to be used to those kinds of stimuli? I don't want to, I don't know what range. I, th I think it's not as long as they gave the fish, but um, you know, uh, why not, why not use the same length? Um, mm -hmm. Well, and that's just, if the timing thing is what you're going for, it'd be interesting to know if other kinds of learning and cognitive processes uh, takes the same amount of time, are the fish always faster, basically? Sure. And I, I think you and I would both guess that, no, the answer is no, they're not always faster. It different, would depend. Different kinds of tests, you know, cleaner asses, there's a good reason why they need to recognize ephemerality, while they need to, they need to recognize something that's short-lived or time, they need to keep tracking of time because they have client fish, quote unquote, client fish who come into their cleaning stations to get parasites removed. It, it behooves that cleaner ass to remember, hey, Joe here was, was here just 10 minutes ago. Joe's not going to have any parasites, whereas uh, Sophie here, it's been three days since I last saw Sophie, she's going to have a lot of parasites. So you can see how that's beneficial to the cleaner ass to know because they're going to inspect Sophie much more because she may have much more food on her. And I think that's yeah. sort of one of the thought to be one of the explanations why they are pretty good at tracking time and have a good sense of ephemerality. Yeah, I wonder if other fish of different species that could have similar vision, of course, because different fish, you know, can see different things depending on what kind of fish they are, like a catfish, would that be able to do it? Because they're maybe yeah. living in more murky water, so maybe they wouldn't be as good. Um, that'd be interesting. I know the just in general, I think the cleaner wrasse and guppies and maybe zebra fish are kind of those top three big fish that folks do studies like this on. Um, yeah, I think one of the paradoxes we're touching on here is that in, sci in science, it's a paradox, is that mm -hmm. for every new study for every piece of knowledge that we advance on that we know we know this new thing and you'd think we would check them one off the list but no of course it raises a whole bunch of new questions uh, what that, about that's the fish? best part about science <laughs> and, and continues to build on itself yeah, yeah. Now, now doc your, your your dad had a question he wanted to ask you want to ask that <laughs> yeah so um my wonderful father so uh i told him that <laughs> I was going to be part of this interview and I was very excited to get to talk to you. And I told him the title of your book. Uh, he's an architect, by the way, not a biologist. So just get that out of the way. Um, and I said, well, the title of his book is, you know, what a fish knows. And my father interrupted me before I could tell him who you were. And he said, do fish know that they are wet? That was my father's question. <laughs> It's great. It's, a it's good great. Question. It speaks to a question I encountered when I was researching the book, which is essentially the same question. It was something like, do fish have any sense of water? Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we have a sense of air, but we may be, um, we may be unique in that, that among terrestrial animals. I mean, uh, well, maybe not, because there are a lot of animals who dive underwater, like beavers and otters, and, and who, who nevertheless breathe air and spend most of their time in the air. I would think I would think whales and dolphins have a sense of air and they, I would think they have a sense of water. But of those species who don't cross that barrier so much, like deep sea fish, I would think don't, certainly don't have a sense of a, a concept of air and 
of, of a medium other than the water. Um, uh, whether that's the case for any terrestrial creatures, you know, most terrestrial creatures can see water and most of them will touch it at some point. They have to drink to, to live. I was thinking of swifts who spend a better part of a year on the wing. But but uh, anyway, um, it's an interesting, interesting perspective. It sounds like the, the, the thinking of a philosopher more than an architect, but they, <laughs> they can cross. They can, they can interact. I won't let, I'll make sure it won't go to his head. <laughs> his, his ego will be out of control. That's right. All right, Jonathan, what do you what do you want to say to people like I mean, you're, you're obviously this this book is in a lot of ways controversial. There's a lot of people who immediately are going to be turned off by this whole concept of, of fish. Have, be, have the, First of all, fish being diverse enough to have all these feelings. Um, what, what's a takeaway you think like a person who handles fish on a daily basis who maybe doesn't agree with the concept, concept of this book, but can take something from it? What can we get from this for those people who maybe are put off by this whole idea? Of fish feelings. Well, I think you know, in a, it would be it would be to encapsulate kind of what we've been covering here, which is that um, you know, question the old biases that you grew up being fed. Mm-hmm. Um, what does the science say? And my book is one of just one source. I would say the best, but no, I wouldn't. <laughs> you should it's say it. One it's it's well written. So. Source where it's all in one place, mm-hmm. where you can. You know, read it with a critical, critical eye. But I'm I'm citing science here. I'm I'm trying to back up what I'm saying by science. As Erica says, I include some stories too, which are less rigorous. But I think the takeaway is, as I said earlier, they're individuals. They're unique. They are. They have lives. They're thinking. They're feeling. They have emotions. No, they're probably not felt the same way ours are. But they're felt in their own ways. And maybe as Erica implied a few minutes ago, maybe in some ways that we don't experience. So, you know, they, they're, they're individuals and fishing, I, I get it. I get why it's fun. I'm a bird watcher. I, it's exciting to go into the woods and what am I going to see today? Am I going to see a barred owl? Am I going to hear a, a, a Clark's Nutcracker or what have you? Um, very exciting. Uh, I prefer to be non-consumptive or, or minimally consumptive in my own hobbies with animals. Uh, but I know a lot of people are passionate about fishing. Um, I, at the very least, if you're engaged in fishing, I think it's you have a responsibility to know to know the creature you're you're killing or you're c- catching and maybe harming, and so I would urge people to to read up and 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 see what the science says. Yeah, and I couldn't agree with that more. I think we should know what we're doing, and the more we know, the better off we're all going to be. Um, and use barbless hooks if you can. Please. I think that's so wise. <laughs> all right, uh, Jonathan, that's that's all of our time. Thank you so much for your time today. Do you have any last takeaways, or are we good? Covered off? Uh, no, just if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, All Things Fish, it's a monthly newsletter. You can go to my website, which is myname.com, and subscribe there. And uh, thanks, Clay, for having me on. And Erica, real pleasure to meet you and talk to you too. Not yes. a problem. Thanks. And we'll put that <laughs> links up at fishners.com so people can link right up to it and we'll share it on Facebook as well. Jonathan, thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thanks for having me, Clay. All right. And that's the whole interview. So now we can just relax. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> ah! All right. Boy. How was that? That was good. What'd you think, Doc? Well, my headphones just fell out. <laughs> oh, I was so excited. Your headphones popped out of your head. I guess so. Ah, uh, boy, he's good. <laughs> he practices. Yeah. yeah. So now yeah, you've I'm, talked to him. What do you think? Uh, he answered exactly how I expected him to answer all my questions, <laughs> 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 which is good. Um, but that's, yeah, it's a lot of the questions, you know, mine are more just, let's have a chat about it. There's no answer. You can't answer them. No. Um, but I think that's, what's interesting. Right. And I think it'll be interesting because I disagree with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if the fish nerds will know that or not. Cause it's like, you know, I, I don't really go fishing. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I don't like to do harm in general, but to his very, he goes a little bit extreme on that anthropomorphism. Like this means they are feelings. This means they are personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, and on a very, in a very human way that we understand those words. Now he didn't say that during the interview. No, he, he rolled that back. Very basic definition. Da, 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 uh, and it's like, I remember being a little bit more intense in the book, but. Yeah. Well, he, okay. now, now he's been traveling around. This book has really made him famous. Mm-hmm. He's been practicing answering these questions, so he knows. Oh, yeah, he he's got the he's got him answered. I'm, I I certainly appreciate him coming on the show. Oh yeah, um, that was great. But I know it's funny. I would argue that I anthropomorphize animals more than more than anyone because I don't know what else to do with them. Like it's all I do is put voices in the heads of animals I see. 
Oh, well, Scott and I use voices yeah. for our pets. Like, yeah. yeah, I do it for everything. Yeah, it's you great. Know? Like if I catch a fish, I'm like, oh, he doesn't like that very much, which is <laughs> accurate. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, overall, I, I recommend everyone read the book and and draw some conclusions out of it. And mm-hmm. probably the biggest takeaway I think we can all do is. Even I think he at the beginning of the interview he said this. If if you could be just a little bit kinder to the fish, we're moving in the right direction. So yep. I think it's my I favorite. think it, I think if we could just be kinder in general, even. Oh. <laughs> Screw you, Doc. I know. You're only, you're only saying that because you got a new baby at home and you're worried about the world. <laughs> I would have said that before. <laughs> yeah. I, Actually, I, I'm, I'm not worried about the world because statistically it's like safer now than it ever has been. Mm-hmm. Um so Actually, we're heading in a really good direction. That's uh, you um, quoting I Stephen Pinker, of, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, I am. So it's That's funny in the book. book. In the book, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Pinker is quoted in the book as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and and for those looking for Stephen Pinker's a uh, professor, I think at uh, somewhere near Boston, some Harvard or something like that, or MIT, and he makes a case that statistically speaking, we are in the safest time ever in human history, and now is the best safest time to be a kid ever in the history of our world. Uh, it's less violence against women and children, less kidnapping, less everything. And so more education. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so that's a whole nother thing. And I don't know if Stephen Pink will ever come on the show. But it's now, not fish related, but it is a really good book. I can connect anything to fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doc, I'm going to end this now. Okay. I have to do actual real work. Thank you. Thanks for coming on today. I have a baby that's crying, so I'm sure dad is ready for me to come in. (laughs) Go do it. (laughs) Thanks, Doc. All right. See ya. Bye-bye. So that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Uh, Special thanks uh, to uh, Jonathan Balcom from What a Fish Knows for coming on the podcast and dealing with with us, uh, with my silly brain. Uh, We feel very lucky to have had him on the show. Big thanks, Doc Martin, for making us sound smart. Uh, and thanks to all our Patreon supporters. We'll get back to all the regular format next week. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd, spawn early, spawn often, never trust a free lunch of strings attached, and spin, spin, <laughs> swim against the current every chance you get. Now use barbless hooks to make Jonathan happy. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, it's a podcast, just for the hell of it, fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan, eat it raw like you're in Siam, Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, it's a podcast.